The Carthaginian by W. Derek Atkins. I have always been afraid of the sea. From my earliest memories, I have always been terrified of the sea. I grew up hearing stories about the sea from my father and my uncles. They told awful stories, stories of great storms, frightening sea creatures, shipwrecks, and sudden attacks by barbaric sea pirates. The only hope a sailor has is that the gods of the sea will spare his life and not smash it to pieces against some distant shore, far from home. Today, I am far from home. My home is the mighty city of Carthage, thousands of leagues west of this port city I find myself in. And as I think of home, my thoughts turn to my family, my wife and children, to my brothers, to my mother, and finally, to my father. I sigh at the thought of my father, Salakar. I know he would have been proud to see me, to see the man I have become, and to see the promise that lies before me. I am now a navigator, observing the stars and the wind so that I may guide our ship safely on the great sea. And if the gods are willing, I will one day captain my own ship. Not even Hiram, my older brother, can keep me from having my own ship. Yes, father would be most proud of me. But my father will never see the man I have become, for he perished at sea four winters ago during a violent storm. The only survivor from that storm, an oarsman named Bod Melcott, told my grieving mother the story of how he perished. It was a terrible storm, one of the worst he'd ever seen, when it seemed as though all the gods meant to smash father's boat like it was a dusty parchment of papyrus. To the very end, father struggled with every muscle he had to hold his ship together. But my father was no match for the gods of the sea. My mother, Isabel, still mourns for him. Even now, she still treasures the amulet father bought for her in the Egypt port city of Heraklion during one of his voyages. It is an amulet with a knot of Isis engraved on it. Father told mother that one of Isis' many names is the moon shining over the sea, and he told her that whenever she saw the moon, she could be sure that Isis' smiling, beneficent gaze was looking down upon him as he sailed the great sea. But the gods are most capricious, and father's luck ran out. Even though mother worships Tanith rather than Isis, she still treasures the amulet father gave her as a reminder of him. Still, my mother is not the first woman to lose a husband to the sea, nor will she be the last. And may the gods preserve me, or else my wife, Zidona, will become another one of Carthage's many widows, and my children will never see me again. That is why I always offer sacrifices to Melkart, the god of the sea and navigation, before I cast off from any land. Thus far, Melkart has spared me whenever I have sailed the sea, but I remain afraid of the sea. Yesterday, we weighed anchor at Joppa, a small port in Israel, on our way northward to Tyre in Lebanon. Although our current cargo is destined for various merchants in Tyre, the crew still does a fair amount of business with Israelite traders who come down to Joppa. But early this morning, we had a most unusual visitor. He is a man of average height, but who possesses strong arms. Maybe he's a carpenter, or more likely, a farmer. Could he be a soldier? Our captain, Osdrubal, spoke with this stranger. I wonder why he came aboard our ship. Ah, here comes our captain, Osdrubal. Osdrubal is a large, strapping man who began his sailing career as an oarsman. Gradually, he worked his way up as he was given more and more responsibility. He is not a man of many words, but everyone aboard our ship respects him. He is a man to be feared. Balayatan. Yes, captain? I say with proper deference. We're taking on a passenger. I am very surprised. We are. Normally, we do not take on passengers. Usually, all we carry is cargo. Yes, we are. Did he say where he wants to go, sir? To Tarshish. I am even more surprised, and cannot contain myself. To Tarshish. Why that's on the other side of the Great Sea. It will take us many days before he reaches his destination. Osdrubal merely grunts. I know. But he's willing to pay for his passage. When do we cast off, sir? Tonight, just after dinner. Why so late, sir? Wouldn't it be better to wait until the morning, when we'll all be fresh? Because our passenger insists on casting off as soon as possible. We are able to navigate at night, as long as the northern star is out. Osdrubal is referring to what the Greeks call the Phoenician star, which enables us to navigate even at night because it does not wander about the heavens. But why is he so anxious, sir? By now, Osdrubal was beginning to grow irritated with my questions. How should I know? Maybe he's running from a business deal that went bad. Maybe he committed murder. Maybe you can find out for yourself when he comes aboard. I'm making you responsible for him. He's never been at sea before. Make sure he keeps safe. Wonders never cease. Why me sir? Because you're the most learned among us. I think our passenger is an educated man, 
too. I recall what little I have observed about this unusual passenger. But he doesn't look educated, sir. How should I know? An exasperated Osdrubal spat out. All I know is, he carries scrolls with him. Why should he carry scrolls around with him if he can't read? But remember, Balayatan, you're responsible for his safety. Abruptly, Osdrubal turns to attend to other matters, ending our conversation. Yes sir, I say to the captain's back. The sun is a ball of golden orange, setting the great sea aflame as it kisses the western horizon. The skies are clear, save for a few feathery distant clouds. Perfect weather for sailing, even if we are setting out into the night. At least I will have no difficulty spotting the northern star and navigating by that fixed, unchanging beacon of light. The crew is busy making final preparations for our departure, and I can hear manly grunts all around me as last-minute cargo is stored below deck, ropes wind, and oars are made ready. On the shore, separated by the shallow, wave-covered beach, several barefoot children stare at our boat, their curly, black hair framing their curious faces, bright faces that are lit not only by their smiles, but also by the warm glow of the setting sun. They wave their hands in a friendly gesture, which I return. Then I notice a burly, bearded man wading through the tide, his legs sinking deeper and deeper into the water as he nears our boat. In one of his arms, the man is carrying three or four scrolls. Ah, this must be our mysterious passenger. Mindful of my responsibility, I make my way amidships and reach out my hand towards the newcomer. He grasps my hand in a powerful grip, and I take note of the rippling muscles on his arm. His muscles suggest he has done much hard labor, likely a lifetime of such toil. His hands are rough, telling me that he works with his hands. He throws a leg over the side of the boat, followed by the other. As he struggles aboard our ship, I greet him, Welcome aboard our ship, sir. Our passenger only grunts as he looks at me. He has a strange look in his face, and I do not quite understand what to make of it. But it is a troubled look, and as I look into his eyes, I feel a strange sense of foreboding about this mysterious man. Please follow me. I'll take you below deck and show you where you can sleep. The passenger remains silent as I lead him down into the space below deck. The wooden steps creak behind me as he follows. In contrast to the brilliance of the setting sun outside, the space below deck is dark and gloomy, although occasional beams of sunlight pierce the gloom, slicing through the air and illuminating floating dust motes. I point to a spot on the floor, a space surrounded by some two dozen clay jars that contain wine. You can sleep there. We won't be moving anything until we get to Tyre, so you won't be disturbed. Again, the passenger only grunts as he sits down and carefully wraps his scrolls in a cloth cover. Above us, I hear Osdrubal giving the order to cast off, and I know I must quickly take my place at the rudder so I can navigate our boat. But still, I hesitate for a brief moment, not knowing what to say to this reclusive man. Finally, I clear my throat. I'll be above, at the rudder, if you want to talk to me. The passenger only stares at me, and I cannot tell what is on his face in the gloom. I quickly bound up the steps, relieved to be back in the dwindling sunlight and away from our mysterious, brooding guest. It is morning now, and the sun is barely above the eastern horizon. It has been a long night for me as I search the heavens to find the North Star. It was a pleasant evening, with a bright moon shining down on us. Was Isis smiling down on us? Was my mother praying to the gods for our safety? I like to think she was. May the gods preserve us. I am tired, and ready to catch a little bit of sleep. Soon, I will hand the task of navigation over to Eshmunaza, my apprentice. Ah, here he comes, with breakfast, bread, cheese, and dates. He sits down next to me. Here's your breakfast, master. I take the bread and break it, giving Eshmunaza a portion to eat. Thank you, master. I smile at Eshmunaza, for he reminds me of when I was an apprentice. He is barely able to grow a beard, and this is his first voyage at sea. I find that I like this young man, and I want to teach him all I can about navigating the great sea. Eshmunaza nervously returns my smile. I bite into the bread, and eat one of the dates that Eshmunaza offers. Eshmunaza begins eating his own bread, and the two of us eat our meal in silence while the ship rises and falls with the gentle swells of the sea. I am almost finished with my breakfast when I see our mysterious passenger climbing up from below deck. His hair is all tangled, no doubt from tossing and turning while sleeping. He pauses for a few moments and looks around in bewilderment, trying to find his bearings. Finally he sees me, and starts to walk toward me, his steps unsteady as the ship continues its unending undulations. I nudge Eshmunaza, and tell him, go ahead and take the rudder when you're finished eating. I'll entertain our guest. Yes, master, 
Eshmunaza dutifully replies. I walk over to the passenger, and greet him. Good morning, sir. The passenger mumbles something I can't quite make out. Perhaps he's not had a good night's sleep. Many who sail the sea for the first time are unable to sleep well on the first night. I attempt to make conversation. Have you had breakfast yet? The bearded man shakes his head. Here, have some bread, and dates. I offer him the rest of my bread and several dates to him. He takes them, and bites into the bread. We quickly find an unoccupied place to sit, next to the boat's side. Our passenger eats in silence for several minutes. Sensing his moodiness, I refrain from saying anything. Suddenly, he looks up at me and asks, Where are you from? Carthage. I feel pride swell up within me as I speak the name of my hometown, and in my mind's eye, I can see its harbour coming into view. And I suppose you've sacrificed a child to one of your gods. The bearded man declares. I am so shocked I am unable to say anything. My mouth hangs open, agape. How could this man possibly know? And now a new image arises in my mind's eye, the face of Mathos, my firstborn. He had such a wonderful laugh, a laugh that brought me many smiles, along with a face that was so expressive we could easily tell what he was feeling. He was a fussy child, but Zidona and I loved him so much because he brought us so much joy, beginning with the day Zidona told me she was pregnant. Perhaps that was why his death brought us so much grief. Another image fills my mind now. Zidona, Mathos, and me at a temple of the god Baal Hammon, the temple filled with the shrill sound of drums and tambourines. Before us stood a statue of Baal Hammon, with his arms outstretched, hands down, over an open hole, which shone with a fearsome red glow. There had been a terrible famine, and as the patron deity of Carthage, Baal Hammon was very hungry. Then came that awful moment when Zidona laid Mathos upon Baal Hammon's outstretched arms. The music around us became even shriller while Baal Hammon consumed our firstborn son. Something died within Zidona that day, and in me. Zidona has never really gotten over Mathos' death, and to this day still keeps Mathos' blanket as a tangible reminder of him. From that moment, our marriage was nothing more than a hollow shell, for although she never said it in so many words, Zidona somehow blamed me for Mathos' death. And ever since then, Zidona and I have not lain with each other. The bearded man is still looking at me with a steady gaze. Suddenly, I resent his question. How dare he say such a thing? Who does he think he is? And then, just as suddenly, I am seized with an overwhelming feeling of remorse. If only Mathos were still alive. In a voice that is raw with emotion, I ask the mysterious stranger, Have you ever lost a child? For several moments, the bearded man says nothing. Then, he gives an almost imperceptible nod, followed by barely audible words. Yes, I have. I wait for him to speak again, and he does not disappoint me. His voice is also hoarse with raw emotion. I lost both my son and my wife while she was giving birth to our firstborn. There was nothing I could do, her last words to me were, Don't be angry at Adonai. With an almost savage tone to my voice, I say, So, your God took your son and your wife. How's your God any different from mine? The bearded man's face jerks up at me, and his countenance is filled with a baleful look. I can see that he is barely in control of a deep rage, a rage that animates his entire being. Adonai is a God of mercy. I am taken aback by the man's statement. After considering his words for a few moments, I say with a voice dripping with mockery, If your God's such a merciful God, then why did he take away your wife and firstborn son? The bearded man hangs his head, as if in defeat. None can fathom the ways of the Most High. I laugh cuttingly at the stranger's words. How convenient for you to say that, when you have no answers. Ha! I agree with you, for no man can understand the ways of the gods. No, your god's no different from mine, he's just as capricious. The man turns on me like a panther pouncing on its prey. He speaks with a feral growl, I know the ways of Adonai. He shows mercy to those who don't deserve any mercy at all, to those whose evils are a stench in his nostrils. From the tone of his voice and the look on his face, I would almost say that this man actually resents the idea that his God is a merciful God. It seems you are angry at your God. I am. I'm angry enough to die. Is that why you're sailing to Tarshish? To die? No, I'm running away from the Most High. With that, the stranger races back toward the darkness of the hold below deck. We arrived at the port of Tyre that afternoon, and weighed anchor there. The next hours were busy ones, with the entire crew working to take our cargo ashore. I and Osdrubal went into town to deliver our consignment to various merchants. Then we went to several other merchants whom we've done business with in the past to inquire as to whether they wished to employ our services again in the shipment of their wares westward. 
To our good fortune, the merchants did indeed desire our services, and our crew spent another several busy hours the next morning loading new cargo aboard our ship. It was not until noon, after we had finished loading the ship, that we were finally ready to cast off for sea again. We are now back at sea again, our ship pitching atop the waves, but I am feeling morose. I cannot get yesterday's conversation with our passenger out of my mind. Nor could I get that conversation out of my mind last night as I lay with a prostitute in my arms. I kept remembering Zidona, and the first few years of our marriage. Like most marriages, ours is an arranged marriage. My father, Salakar, chose to have me marry Zidona, the daughter of Zarakis, a wealthy merchant in Carthage. My parents believed that our marriage would help strengthen the business ties between our two families, and it has. The first two years of our marriage were wonderful years. There was much laughter in our home as we experienced together the joys of marriage. How well I remember our long walks along the seashore, our picnic lunches on the headlands overlooking Carthage's scenic bay. Zidona has a wicked sense of humor, and her comments, though biting, often brought me so much laughter my eyes were brought to tears. She was also so giving, cooking delicious, mouth-watering meals that filled a man's stomach. And her body was so warm, so eager. But all of that changed after Mathos died. Where Zidona's face once shone with the warmth of the sun, her countenance became hard, her presence a blast of cold wind from some northern clime. Is it any wonder that I have turned to the companionship of other women to find the warmth that is now gone from my home? But, if the truth is to be told, I must say that even the most passionate embrace of the most beautiful prostitute cannot replace what I have lost. Surely the gods are a vengeful lot. But this stranger tells me that his god is a god of mercy, who shows mercy towards those who are evil, towards those who don't deserve his mercy at all. How can that be? The gods are capricious and vengeful. How can they be otherwise? Or, if they do show us mercy, it is only because they wish to make sport of us, to raise our hopes so they can dash our hopes against the shoals of vengeance for their amusement. For if there is one truth I know, it is that our world is governed by the iron law of consequences. If we anger the gods, they will surely take their vengeance upon us, unless we appease them, like we do in Carthage, when we offer up our firstborn sons as sacrifices. A god of mercy? The concept is absolutely ludicrous. Ah, best to get such thoughts out of my mind, and concentrate on the task at hand. I look up at our sail, and note where the wind is blowing from. I nudge Eshmunaza, and ask him, which way is the wind coming from? The young apprentice gives his answer, and I continue teaching him how to navigate a small speck of wood such as ours amid the vast expanse of the great sea, pushing all thoughts of yesterday's disagreeable conversation behind me. Perhaps there will be no need for me to return to such thoughts until we reach Tarshish. If I can just avoid that bothersome man with his strange notions, maybe I won't have such troubling thoughts, and I can be free from this moroseness that has overtaken me. I bend all my efforts toward teaching young Eshmunaza his assigned trade. From Tyre, we sailed west towards the island of Cyprus, where we carried ashore a consignment that we took on in Tyre. After a brief stay on the island, we continued our westward journey, our next port of call, another island, Crete. Two days out of Cyprus, the storm hit us. It came upon us with very little warning. It was night time, and the sky was overcast, hiding the moon, which is why we never saw the approaching storm until it was too late. The storm came from the south, and seized our ship with such terrible ferocity we felt like our boat was caught in the jaws of some great sea monster. The wind shrieked with a fearsome wail, assaulting our ears with its constant roar and stabbing our hearts with mortal fear. We were certain that our ship would break apart at any moment. We have lost all track of time now, and we do not know how much longer we can take this fearsome tempest. Each one of us has called upon his own god. Next to me Eshmunazar is calling out to Tanith, while Osdrubal is calling out to Astarte. Around me, I can hear different oarsmen calling out to Isis, Baal-Hammon, Yam, and a dozen other gods and goddesses. As for me, I am calling upon Melkart to preserve our lives. And still the storm continues to rage around us, with the rain slashing at our skins like sharp knives, and the deck completely awash with water. Have the gods chosen to turn deaf ears to our cries for help? The noise of the storm is so great that I can barely hear the voices of those next to me, much less my own words. Osdrubal now turns to me, and yells into my ear, we must throw our cargo overboard. We must lighten our ship, or we'll surely sink. I know he's telling me this partly because I represent Hiram, who ultimately owns the ship. I nod my head in agreement. We don't have much choice. Better to save our lives and take a loss than for all of us to perish. Throw them all overboard. With great effort, Osdrubal passes his orders to the rest of the crew, 
and we all begin the arduous task of throwing our cargo overboard in a desperate attempt to lighten our vessel so it doesn't sink under the crashing waves. This task is all the more dangerous because of the risk of being washed overboard by a freak wave or blast of wind while handling the cargo. Finally, we complete our task, and our chests heave from the exertions as we watch all of our cargo either sink into the sea or being tossed about by the angry waves. They are all gone now, clay pots filled with wine, now sinking to the bottom, the richest clothes, once destined for the homes of wealthy men and women, now torn to shreds, succulent fruits from the markets of Tyre, rare perfume, spices, and incense carried to Tyre by Arabian caravans, and dried fish, now returning to the very sea from whence they came. But as I told Osdrugal, it is better for us to lose all these precious goods than for us to lose our lives. I remember the fate that my father met, and I call out once again to Melkart, begging him to spare me from the same fate. Fear courses through my veins. And still, the winds continue to howl, and the waves continue to assault our vessel. And now, Osdrubal turns to me and makes what I find a most curious observation. Where's our passenger? I don't see him anywhere. For some strange reason, I feel as if I have been struck on the forehead with a log. I look around the wind-lashed deck, and sure enough, I cannot see the bearded man anywhere. Remembering how Osdrubal has given me the task of guarding our passenger's safety, I grab the captain's arm and say, he must be somewhere below deck. Let's go find him. We struggle against the fierce wind, and stumble down the stairs into the chamber below deck, nearly falling over ourselves as we make our way down. The hold below deck is completely shrouded in dark, and so Osdrubal hastily runs back up the stairs, and returns quickly with a torch in his hand. Osdrubal now waves the torch around so as to light our way. A minute later, I am stunned when light from our torch falls upon a huddled form. Osdrubal is enraged. Asleep. In a storm like this. How is that possible? Agitated, the captain practically pounces upon our mysterious passenger and violently shakes him awake. How can you sleep like this? Startled by the rude shaking, the passenger utters a frightened cry and jerks upright, bumping his head into the captain's. The passenger looks from the captain's face to mine, and back again as he tries to make sense of what is happening. It is obvious that Osdrubal has suddenly awakened him from a deep sleep, although like my captain, I am greatly bewildered at how it is possible for any man to sleep in the middle of a terrible storm such as the one we are in now. Osdrubal startles the passenger again as he suddenly seizes him by both arms, shaking him. How can you sleep in the middle of a storm like this? Get up and call on your God. Perhaps he will take notice of us and save us from this terrible storm. Now hurry, before we all drown. It is some time later, and all of us are huddled together below deck. The ship continues to heave as the storm's rage refuses to relent. Eshmunaza holds the torch, casting a circle of light on the wooden planks beneath us. The circle of light weaves back and forth as the ship rocks. The light from the torch casts a dancing, yellowish glow on everyone's face, bringing wrinkles, noses, and eyes into sharp relief. The crew's mood is an ugly one, for despite all our prayers, despite all our efforts to lighten the ship, the storm continues unabated. A good number of the crew's eyes are now fastened on our mysterious passenger, and I know that they, like me, are all wondering whether this man has anything to do with our dire straits. There is an uneasy quiet among us, a quiet that is broken only by the howling wind outside, and the groaning of the ship's planks as they continue to withstand the constant battering from the wind and the waves. Finally, Javnit, one of the oarsmen, speaks. We should cast lots to find out who's responsible for this disaster. Javnit's eyes flick over to the passenger accusingly. The other sailors quickly take up Javnit's suggestion, adding their voices to his, and the hold is quickly filled with the sounds of one man after another demanding that we cast lots. Knowing that he may have a mutiny on his hands if he refuses his crew's request, Osdrubal nods his head in agreement. Very well then. Let's cast lots to find out who's responsible for this calamity. Osdrubal draws out a cloth pouch, opens it, and pours out several pieces of wood. On each wood is inscribed a letter from the Aramaic alphabet. Osdrubal then gives instructions. Each man is to take a lot. Then I will shake the lots and will see who is responsible for this terrible storm. Each one of us chooses a lot, including our passenger, who reluctantly chooses a lot, and puts it back into the pouch. Osdrubal then raises his head and prays, may the gods direct these lots, and show us who is responsible for bringing this terrible calamity upon us. Osdrubal shakes the pouch, and all of us hold our breath, fearful of what the gods will say. I have witnessed the casting of lots several times to decide how to divide property, or who will undertake a certain task. It is the only way, really, to determine what the gods really want, for to decide otherwise places the decision in human hands, and we all know how flawed humans are. The shaking continues, 
and we are all in a state of suspense, which is quickly becoming unbearable. If only Osdrubal will stop shaking, and let a lot jump out. Then we'll know. Suddenly, Osdrubal lets out a cry as a lot flies out of the pouch and bounces along the wooden planks. All of us bend over the lot anxiously, fearing the result. I knew it. Jabnet cries out. The lot's fallen on our passenger. The eyes of everyone now fasten upon the mysterious, bearded man. The passenger only hangs his head in resignation. Once again, there is an awkward silence as each man takes in what the lots have said. And now Osdrubal begins to question our passenger. The tone of his voice is almost accusing. Tell us, who's responsible for bringing all this trouble upon us? Jabnit throws a question of his own at the mysterious man. Who are you? Where do you come from? More questions rain down from all sides. What country do you come from? What people are you from? What did you do? More and more questions rise from the sailor's lips, and the cacophony within the hold rises higher and higher, until Osdrubal shouts, Quiet, everyone. Everyone stops speaking, and Osdrubal continues, Let the man speak. Let him answer our questions. In a frightened, broken voice, our passenger speaks. My name is Yona ben Amitai, and my hometown is Gath Heifer. Where's Gath Heifer? An oarsman asks. Gath Heifer is in the region of Galilee, in the land of Israel. Several men murmur, Israel, and nod their heads. Yes, that fits in with his arrival at Joppa. What do you do? Another oarsman asks. I am a carpenter, Yona answers in a meek voice. I make chairs, tables, and other furnishings. You're running away from your god, aren't you? Jabnet asks. Everyone on board knows you are. Isn't that why you're sailing to Tarshish? And now, Yona surprises us. Drawing in a deep breath, he speaks with a deep, booming voice. I am a Hebrew, and I worship Adonai, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. At Yona's words, a hush falls over the entire crew as the enormity of his words sink in for all of us. Adonai, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. How can it be? This Hebrew is telling us that his God is the Most High God, who has power over not just the land, not just the sea, and not just heaven, but over all things. And if he does indeed have power over the sea, then he's the one who sent this storm. And now I notice that our ship's pitching has worsened. The men are visibly rocking back and forth as our ship is tossed from one wave to another. How much longer can we survive this storm? Alarmed, Osdrubal asks, then what should we do to make the sea calm down? Another sailor takes up Osdrubal's question. Yes, Yona ben Amitai, what should we do to make the sea calm again? I look into Yona's face. Is that remorse that fills his eyes? Or is it simply resignation? Yona now answers the question. Throw me into the sea. I know that it is my fault that this terrible storm has come upon you, for I have disobeyed Adonai. If you throw me into the sea, Adonai will bring this storm to an end, and the sea will become calm again. At Yona's words, the crew breaks into a feverish discussion. We can't throw him overboard. But what about the lot? The lot fell on him. It's better to lose one man than to lose the entire ship. But we have a sacred duty to preserve the lives of our passengers. How can we say that we honor the gods if we throw this man overboard? Honor. You speak of honor. What honor do we gain if we keep this man aboard and perish at sea? He's not some piece of cargo. He's a man. Surely his life is worth more than some pretty dress, or a jar of wine. And so the discussion continues, the heated words flying from the lips of men who are staring death in the face, men who are afraid that the sea will swallow them up at any moment. Some fear that if we throw this man overboard, Adonai will smite us in his anger, while others fear that if we don't throw this man overboard Adonai will smite us in his anger. Finally, Osdrubal shouts again, quiet. The men are silent again, this time waiting for their captain to speak. Osdrubal does not disappoint them, although surely some disagree with his words. We cannot throw this passenger overboard. We must try to reach land. All of you, back to your oars. The air is filled with a mixture of curses and cries of relief as the men all rouse themselves from their cramped positions and stumble their way up the stairs, back to the waterlogged deck above. I follow, and am instantly soaked by the waves upon reaching the deck. I struggle to reach my assigned place at the rudder, grabbing the side of the boat and holding onto it for dear life as I slosh towards my destination. Within minutes, all of the oarsmen are seated at their stations, and are straining mightily to heave their oars. Loud cries fill the air as these brawny men strive with all their strength to row us back to land. But it is no use, the storm just keeps getting wilder and wilder, and it is obvious that our ship cannot take the sea's rage much longer. Finally, Osdrubal points to Yona and orders, throw him overboard. 
several sailors look at Osdrubal, not believing what they've just heard. Are you sure, Captain? Eshmunazar asks. Yes, I'm sure. Throw Yona ben Amitai overboard. Immediately, Jabnit and another oarsman sees Yona and Frog march him to the boat's edge. But now Osdrubal puts out his hand, keeping the two oarsmen from throwing Yona into the sea. His eyes squinting into the stinging rain, Osdrubal throws his head back and addresses Adonai. Adonai, please don't let us die for killing this man. Don't hold us guilty for taking an innocent man's life. For you, O oh Adonai, have done as you pleased. I am stunned at Osdrubal's words. Yona ben Amitai, innocent? How can that be? For he himself has confessed to disobeying Adonai and running away from the God of heaven. How could anyone possibly think Yona is innocent? But before I have a chance to say anything, Osdrubal brings his hand down, and Jabnit and the other oarsmen throw our strange passenger overboard. And now, a truly amazing thing happens, something I have never seen before. A few moments after we have thrown Yona overboard, the storm begins to abate. The waves start to become less and less fierce, and before I know it, the wind is dying down. And now, the clouds are starting to part, and golden shafts of light pierce down from above. The sea has turned into a bronze mirror, reflecting light from a sun that all of us had only minutes ago feared we would never see again. A few minutes later, the skies are completely clear, and the sea is completely calm again. There is no sign anywhere that there was the most violent storm raging just minutes earlier. This is truly a miracle, and I now know beyond a doubt that Adonai, the God of heaven, who made the land and the sea, exists, and that there is no other God. There is stunned silence among all of us. All of us are safe again, and although we've lost all of our cargo, it seems that we may yet live to see our families again. It is Jabnit who breaks the silence. Surely there is no other God in the world except Adonai. The captain slowly nods his head in agreement. There is no other God. Let us offer him a sacrifice and make vows to Adonai. It is now nearly a month after the storm, and I am in another ship, on my way back to Carthage. After the storm, we were able to sail our battered ship to the port of Miletus in Anatolia. Our ship barely made it to port, and we had to sell it for scrap. Fortunately, we made enough money off of the sale of our ship for each of us to pay our own ways as passengers. I feel the gentle swell of the sea under me, while the salty breeze fills my nostrils, and the sun shines down on my face. In the distance, on the horizon, I can make out the approaching coast of Africa, and I know that every hour brings me a little closer to Carthage, a little closer to journey's end. As I look at sky and sea, my mind turns to what happened during the storm, what Yona said about Adonai, and I find myself voicing a prayer to the Most High. Adonai, God of heaven, who made the land and the sea, hear my prayer. You know I am now sailing home, to Carthage. I do so in obedience to you, for you have told me to return to my home, to my family, and to my wife. Adonai, you know that all these years, I have been running away from my home from my wife. That is why I have sailed the great sea for so many years. And now you have instructed me to return to Zidona and to make things right with her again. But I have so many questions Adonai. How am I to live for you? How can I walk past the temple of Baal Hammond day after day, hearing the music that drowns out the cries of innocent babies, and knowing what takes place inside there? Surely what is done inside those walls is utterly detestable to you. And how can I make things right with Zidona again? Can I bring Mathos back from the dead? There is nothing I can do to undo what has already been done. But I humbly ask you to help me make things right with my wife again. Please restore to us the joy we once had, when there was so much laughter in our home. And forgive me for my unfaithfulness to Zidona. Yona, your servant, told me that you are a God of mercy, who shows mercy to those who do not deserve your mercy. Adonai, you know full well that I do not deserve your mercy, for I have wronged you, and I have wronged others. I have worshipped other gods, and killed my own firstborn son. I have slept with countless prostitutes. For the sake of your name, have mercy upon me. In the midst of the storm, Adonai, you showed your mercy. You had every reason to judge me and the rest of the crew, but Yona, your servant, sacrificed himself for the rest of us, and in your mercy you spared our lives. Surely, you are rich in mercy, not counting our sins against you. And where am I to find your people in Carthage? How can I remain faithful to you when I see my brothers again? What will I say to them when they ask me to go with them to some temple to worship this god or that goddess? Adonai, give me the courage to tell them about you, to tell them of how you rescued my life from a watery grave, and how you are the only God in all the world. Give me the courage to remain faithful to you, even when my own family fails to understand why I must worship you alone. And give me wisdom to know what to say, what not to say, when to speak, and when not to speak. 
Teach me your ways, Adonai, that I may please you. Teach me your ways.